Uh, my name is Bob Cross. I'm from the Department of the Navy. I'm going to talk to you today about not frameworks, not Groovy, not Scala. This is Java, pretty much pure and simple. A lot of Java desktop solving problems that maybe you didn't know existed. All right, so we're talking about this Spearfish underwater tracking system that we use at a bunch of the US Navy ranges and several of our allied ranges use it as well in one variation or another. Spearfish is 100% Java. Uh, it's entirely written in Newport. There's six or seven core people who've been working on it for somewhere between seven, 15 years, possibly a little bit more in some cases. Uh, we're deployed on Windows and Linux. Uh, we run on laptops. We run on, you know, basically commodity hardware. In general, people get a little skeezed out when we deploy on laptops because it's not very impressive. But I can run most of the real-time operations of the Autech range from this vendor-supplied laptop right here. Uh, we can track to quite a deep depth. Uh, we can track as deep as our Navy assets can go. And that brings me to a very important point. Everything I'm going to say today is unclassified. Uh, the things that I'm talking about do have classified performance metrics. I will not be coy. If there's something that I can't speak about, I will try to point you to a source. And I have the public affairs contact information at the end of the brief if there's something you'd like to ask more about. And if I don't know which condition it's in, I'll tell you. You know, we're not going to fool around here. Um, we can track a lot, of, a lot of targets and we can track them very fast. Uh, we're talking about commodity hardware, like I said. The modern multi-core processors allow us with the basic concurrency that we get from Java to go at least 100 times real time in most of the scenarios that we're dealing with. And when I say we eat our own dog food, I'm not kidding. This is actually a system that I've taken out to sea in situations where I had the opposite problem that you would normally think of. The water was too flat. So the kind of missions that we're actually talking about, and I, when I use missions, you know, very carefully, we're talking mostly about training exercises where we have officer candidates, for instance, uh, prospective commanding officers who are learning how to drive a submarine. And they're chasing other submarines around, they're chasing targets, they're getting chased by helicopters that are looking for them. Uh, we can have surface ships doing the same sort of thing, gunfire exercises. We also talk about test and evaluation of systems, and that could be a new weapon type, for instance, or a weapon with new com control software on it. And then we also have sort of new scenarios, and that's the catch-all, where we take some piece that we have in inventory and we try to get it to do new things, sometimes things that you did not know were possible. That's always fun. So this is the problem space in which I operate. The ocean hates all of us. It hates me in particular, but humans in general. All right, there's nothing about the ocean that makes the tracking problem any easier. Anything you would normally think of, you know, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today has parallels to GPS tracking. Uh, just some of the same vocabulary in the applications that we're talking about. Nothing about GPS works. Nothing about lasers, nothing about radio waves, none of that works underwater. It's great at absorbing energy, except for acoustic energy. Certain frequencies carry quite a long ways because the ocean water is not really compressible. It'll carry that energy, you know, as far as we want it to in certain frequency bands. Unfortunately, there's a bunch of stuff in the water that's already making noise, squarely in some of the bands that we care quite a lot about. Uh, and the final problem is that the Navy really doesn't care about my convenience. They're out there to do their job, and if I can track, uh, I had better track. It comes straight down from the Admiral. All right, so here are some of the major system components. And the Java portion is if we follow this curve all the way down and up to the left, everything from detection reports up. Those are the Java components that I'm going to be speaking about. But we've got systems in the water. That would be the big red oval. That could be a submarine. That could be a weapon. That could be a submarine simulator. That little green triangle is what we call a pinger. There's a box or a ring or something. It's basically a transducer. It's an emitter in the water that sends out signals. And that curved line, that line is curved for a reason, okay, that none of our signals go in a straight line. You know, GPS deals with this a little bit. Our curves are dramatic. And we get down to our hydrophones, which is the microphone on the bottom. And 
usually way deep down in the water. So we're talking about 2,000, 4,000 meters down. We have hard lines going back to shore that are talking to the signal processor system. That's where we have real time tag tagging. This is not Java. That is sitting in a digital signal processor box, also made in Newport, but that's running, you know, a Linux kernel and that's dealing with signal processing cards. And they take all that racket and they turn it into detection reports that I can then turn into track and put up on the screen. And that's the Spearfish underwater tracking and display system. So the ping that we send out, it's an encoded signal. It's in most of the cases that I'm dealing with nowadays, we have essentially an identifier which is 76 bit long, which is a Hamming code. It is essentially counting up from 1 to 12. So we have 12 different 76 bit codes. This pinger that we've got mounted to the box just transmits those pings for me. Usually once a second if we're down at AUTEC, for instance. We've got sound going through the water and it goes roughly 1500 meters per second. It is never going exactly that speed for any time. Any time that I think I know what the speed is, it's going to change because of depth or salinity or temperature. There's a hydrophone down at the bottom and the detection report is just essentially taking the acoustics that came into me or it came into the system and it's turning into data that I can play with on the Java side. All right, so the goals of the deployed system. Range safety is absolutely the most important one. And again, this is not a problem that most people are going to be talking about today. We have, for instance, two submarines. They are actively hiding from each other and trying to find the other one. Because they're hiding, they don't know where the other one is. And I don't know if you've seen Hunt for Red October where, you know, ooh, this is neat. We can see the submarines and it's really close together. Leaving aside the question of the fact that it's really dark underwater and you wouldn't be able to see the submarines, if they were that close, there would be a huge brouhaha as we would send messages up from our bi-directional phone saying, no you guys, you're way too close. Because you cannot turn like they do in the, in the movie. They're like fighter planes. So we based, on our end, we have to basically detect and track range participants. This could be a submarine that just clicked off its pinger. It could be a surface ship. It could be an exercise torpedo dropped from a helicopter that's going to go down and then come back up to the surface and need to be recovered. So we're now tracking it on the surface so the recovery boat can drive out and pick it up. We've got to scale and degrade based on how much da data is going on. We can never drop down below the data flow that's coming in. So we can never run it below real time. And when I say real time, I'll talk about exactly what that means. We need to let somebody know if there are problems and we need to provide some accuracy. And accuracy is a term that changes based on context. We have absolute accuracy which is relative to essentially GPS accuracy. You can have relative accuracy where if I know that these two submarines have a, a skew and they're off by some number of meters off to one side, as long as I know the separation between them, they're not going to hit and the admiral won't get mad at me. All right, so real time. Different system components have different real time capabilities. When we're talking about the conversion of the acoustics into detection reports, we need sub millisecond accuracy, hopefully down in the microsecond world. We're talking about 76 bit signals at 13 kilohertz ish. Uh, that's a fairly long signal. We'd like the time tag to be right on the leading edge as it arrives at the hydrophone. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Remember what I said about the ocean not caring. All right. Depending on how the tra track accuracy goes, that starts eating into my error budget. Okay. If the signal processor can't time tag to a, some level of accuracy, there's nothing I can do past that point. It's not garbage in, garbage out, but it's less delicious, you know, going through the, the recipe. We have some latency. And again, there's nothing we can do about this. Speed of sound, roughly 1500 meters per second. If you think about the depth of the water, you know, we have hydrophones that are easily 3000 meters deep. That's two seconds straight down, best case. So already I am behind real time. And as I, I need, as I'll show you, I need to accumulate data from many of the hydrophones. So there's nothing I can do about it. I have to wait for the signal to go out to those phones, collect it, and then turn that into a track as quickly as I can. But that transit through the water, that's just a consequence, again, ocean, not caring. We need to be multi-threaded in the sense of we can't hold up our processing. 
Anything that we put on the screen can't slow down the processing of the data. Most importantly, we can never ever lose any of the data that we receive. Okay, there's 100% data retention. That is actually a requirement. Okay, there are softer requirements when it comes to display in terms of they really, really, really want to see all the data on the screen, but if you have to sacrifice one, it's the data retention in the database that's the most important. All right, so this is essentially the funnel of data as I'm talking about the whole system. Like I said, we've got a lot of acoustics going on, ping, 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 we've got snapping sh shrimp, we've got mammals, which are a phenomenal benefit to the ecology and kind of a hassle when it comes to tracking. Turns out that some of our tracking capabilities can uh, produce quite a lot of interesting information about the mammals. And we're funneling it all the way down and as we neck it down further and further, we're trying to turn it into a location. All right, so like I said, a ping is an encoded, encoded acoustic signal. The payload, as far as I'm caring, there's a target ID, 1 through 12 or two 1 through th uh, 12 codes. So that allows me either on range 12 items, could be submarines, could be weapons, could be targets, could be surface ships, or if I'm using what are called frame pings, up to 63. 63 targets would be a lot for the Navy to field at one time. It is not a lot for tracking. Tracking is fine with that much. All right, so each one of these pingers has a repetition rate. Just like in GPS where we're talking about a one second signal, quite often we're talking about a one second pinger. In certain circumstances, we use a different repetition rate in, for instance, a vehicle that does not move very fast. Because like I said, we're pushing all these acoustics through the water. If I can avoid a little bit of noise pollution, I can potentially get a more accurate track on things that I care about a lot. Like for instance, weapons. I care a lot about weapons. And these pingers tend to point down. Okay, this becomes a problem if, for instance, my weapon gets to the end of run, comes towards the surface, now it's emitting energy away from the hydrophones that I'm listening on. And that can be a problem. Again, ocean not care. So, then we have this concept called a splash. A splash is anything else. That's tracking mammals, that's tracking gunfire scoring, that's tracking simulated weapons that we push out of a helicopter. And if you look super, super closely, you can see me sitting in the port side gunner seat of that UH-60. And this is one of those situations where I bring the pictures home and show them to my kids who I had up on the screen earlier. And they're like, dad has the coolest job ever. Okay, because this is the low flight where we're down at about 100 feet up and we push the big marker buoy out of the, the helicopter, makes basically a kabloosh. The bigger one on the bottom is from a, uh, 1,500 feet and that made quite a kaboom. It was really neat. It took a long time as I was watching it fall. Okay, so backing up again. And I, I know that I'm going through this several times but Nobody else in Java 1 is talking about anything like acoustics, so I'm doing this super quick overview of some of the system components so that I can get to the Java part. That's coming. We're almost there. All right, so hydrophones detecting sounds. The sound is converted to a voltage. Not useful to me at this point. They take that voltage in the signal processor and turn that into a ping or a splash detection report. And they start turning it into data that I can process. Now, limitations on the signal processing side. Like I said, the water is noisy. Not only can it mean that we potentially lose data, we can also get corrupt data coming in on the detection report. This is a real problem. No one cares. I still have the requirement to track. Uh, we have these bad angles. That could mean that I'm getting further and further off range. I'll show you during the demo the actual range coverage area. Again, you know, the guys operating the range want to be able to say this particular submarine is coming on range. I expect them to be on site at such and such time. They want a large footprint. Range safety, you know, and also range scheduling. All right. Now we're in the Java world. Okay, this is everything that I deal with all the time. The tracking part of the problem, I've said detection reports a lot of times. Like I said, detection reports can get corrupted if we got potentially bad data. So we have to run through a validation process. That is a, essentially a set of rules that says, here's my raw stream that's coming in from this particular hydrophone. Based on the logical rules that I can go with, what subset of data here is probably valid for the target that I'm looking for at this time? 
Then I have to turn it into a localization. That's saying take the data from multiple hydrophones, the valid data that came out of the validation process as we're coming down sort of through the tentacles, take a bunch of those validated data streams, start turning those into positions. Now I have to couple that with the sound velocity profile. Like I said at the beginning, the sound never goes in a straight line, so all the geometry that we'd like to try to solve is extra complicated and squishy and requires a lot of approximation. All of this work to get one point on the screen at a time. It's a lot of installation, one point per second usually. Okay, some of the limitations. Like I said, 1500 meters per second. Plenty of the assets that we're talking about can travel in excess of at least 1% of that speed. This is not a problem that you deal with in GPS with light speed. There is no time when anything you can track with a GPS system goes 0.1 C. It doesn't happen. It happens to us all the time. No one cares. Okay, a knot, a nautical mile just for rule of thumb, I'm gonna flip between units every now and then. I can do math better in meters, but a knot is about, if you're talking about a meters per second, a, that's about two knots. So it's okay for doubling. And you'll see immediately, again, the ranges like to use whatever units they use. So they're using feet and they're using yards and all sorts of crazy numbers that I don't use anymore. And like I said, we have plenty of latency in the whole equation. All right, now, getting into requirements other than the tracking, we also have this weird sort of derived requirement that is everything has to be deterministic all the time. So we've got a data flow architecture where all of this data is coming in through the hydrophones and going through validation, et cetera. If I rerun that exact same data, no matter what speed I push it into the system, the output has to be identical. This is a requirement. <laughs> it's kind of frustrating because a lot of your parallelization options don't apply in that situation or uh, the architecture gets a little bit more complicated. We have to run essentially with a flexible buffer to deal with this latency issue. As we're trying to capture all the data that's required to track a particular system at a particular point on the range, the depth varies on the range. We could be looking at hydrophones that are 1,500 meters deep. Some of them are 900 meters deep. Some of them are 4,000 meters deep on the same range. So we're constantly varying this buffer to say, how long do I have to wait before I get all of the useful data? And a lot of what I'd like to be able to parallelize, too bad. It has to be single threaded because of all this de the determinism requirements. All right, so backing up a little bit, when I was talking about the validation process, this is kind of what it looks like. If you look at this bottom row, I've got, you know, a time axis going by on the bottom and, okay, I'm just going to describe it. I'm not going to make you look at the numbers. Except that big bars are good, green and yellow bars, valid, everything else, less good. All right, so on the bottom, Hydrophone 7 is receiving what looks to be about one ping per second. And it looks like we've got mostly yellow and green. That's all looking great. There's a little bit of blue way off to the left there. Up there on Hydrophone 1, we've got a little bit of validated that seems to have started. Everything else kind of looks like a snowstorm. Nothing really good contributing to the track at this point. I need more data than this before I can start tracking. Again, this is one of the layers of frustration that we deal with. It looks like we're receiving data. We won't have track at this point. So you have your range customer who's then yelling at you saying, I see numbers. It's like, yeah, but you're not going to have track yet. So this is what some of the sort of data input looks like. This top line, again, I'm not going to make you read it. You can see there are 12 codes on the, the sequence pings. They're running through essentially 0 to 15, and then they roll over. Basic counter going over and over. There's also this M and LLL. That's an encoded depth. There's a depth sensor on the pinger. For once, somebody's trying to make my life a little bit easier. And it's trying to tell me, mm, I'm roughly at this depth. Except they're not going to tell me the real number. They're going to tell me four bits at a time. So they're going to tell me a high nibble or a low nibble. And they're thinking, well, the low nibble will probably change more often. So once a second, I get part of the numbers. Unfortunately, this is the most easily corrupted part of the ping. So as I'm doing data reconstruction, I'm sitting there trying to do bit matching between all of these different hydrophones, trying to figure out how many of these ones and zeros should actually be on. Down at the bottom, we have a different pattern. Instead of saying 
okay, I'm counting all the way up to 15, I have sort of a syncopated rhythm between two different codes. You can see this 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2. That's what I would call a framed ping, where instead of telling me I am ping 0, I am ping 1, I am ping 2, it's saying somewhere in this, if you keep track of where you are in the pattern, that you can deduce what index this is. Um, this actually makes things fairly complicated, and this is a little bit down in the weeds, but again, it goes with the theme of no one makes anything easy for me. This allows the Navy to have more targets on range at the same time. Actually more targets than they can ha currently deploy in most of the exercises that we deal with. And you'll see, if I'm using a sequence ping, which I'm not going to use in the, the example data today, I have mostly green, a little bit of yellow. The frame pings are mixes of yellows and greens when they're validated. All right. All of that was validation. Now we're talking about localization, and this is where anybody who's worked on a GPS type system, some of these words will sound familiar. I have validated data that came out of my validation process. I have known hydrophone lo locations on the bottom, and finding all those hydrophones once they've been deployed down to sub meteor accuracy is an experience. That is a, a fairly heavy duty evolution. They do an extensive hydrophone survey and they mathematically compute using multiple GPS antennas. All right, the hydrophone must be here 4,000 meters down. That's very important. And then they use those positions for upwards of 20 years. Because funnily enough, things don't really change down there very often. So I've got my hydrophone locations. I have that ping ordering. It's the sequences or the frames. And I have my sound velocity profile. Now using all of that, I need to come up with a position. And this, I'll show you what this looks like. This is a spherical, lo this is a spherical tracking problem, sort of in action. And as you can see, it doesn't seem to be lining up quite right. This is the tracking that you would normally use. This is what is often used in the GPS tracking algorithms, is hyperbolic tracking. What they do is they say, all right, I know that I received a signal. In this case, I'm emitting from somewhere on this curve in the center. I know that I have a time of arrival at hydrophone A, I have a time of arrival at hydrophone B, and as I look at those two times, as ping one arrives at those two phones, it arrived at hydrophone one one second earlier than it arrived at hydrophone two. So I'm looking at a curve where the time difference of arrival is identical. So in the center it could be time is one, on the, you know, connecting to a time two, and then time two, time three, time three, times, times four. So that's going to drive a curve through the water. So that's the harder one. This is really the easy one. Once I know the actual time of emission, which again, in uh, the GPS situation you usually do, because those clocks are going out once a second exactly on the time, if I have a, what's called a synchronous pinger in the water, I can do spherical tracking. And that's just saying, all right, I know the time of arrival, I know my time of emission, my delta time there divided by the speed of sound through the water, that's going to define a radius. So I have a radius of possible positions around hydrophone A, I have a radius of possible positions around hydrophone B. If I look at where those two things intersect, there's two possible positions. If these hydrophones are sitting on the bottom and I'm looking at essentially top and bottom, I am fairly certain that my submarine is not beneath those two hydrophones because there's dirt there. Okay, so with those two phones, I can make a reasonable guess. All right, that's really not quite enough because, like I keep saying, sound doesn't travel in straight lines in the water. So what we do is we use what's, we use a ray tracing approximation to pretend that it does. What we do is we cast a whole bunch of rays through these sound velocity profiles and say, how about if the pinger was here talking to this hydrophone? Well, that would be this particular ray path. Well, imagine there was just a straight line. Let's take that transit time divided over this particular straight line path and call that an effective sound velocity profile. Essentially what we do is we build a great big lookup table. Doesn't take too terribly long. It is currently infeasible for us to do this every ping, which is once per second for every submarine and weapon that's currently in the water. But by doing that, we are able to meet essentially our engineering requirements. You know, the accuracy that we lose by not doing the full ray trace isn't any worse than what we're dealing with with the 
accursed snapping shrimp that are messing with our pings. So like I said, we pre-compute all the data and then we store a whole bunch of ta tables. We can store per month, we can store per day, we can store per exercise, or we can just say, look, 1500 meters per second. We don't have time to measure. And like I said, we'll get relative accuracy at that point. Everything will be skewed kind of the same direction. All right, so spherical tracking, there are th three kinds, but here's essentially how the mathematics work. Like I said, if I have two phones, I have some left right ambiguity. I can't be pick between those two possible solutions. If I add another phone, so now I'm listening on three phones, so I've listened long enough that now I'm getting data from hydrophone C, it looks like in the 2D case, and by the way, we never assume that water is flat. We understand that the earth is curved. We do deal in Cartesian coordinates just because it's easier to do the math. But in the Z plane, you know, there's actually a curve of water, latitude, longitude, depth. Let's just be clear. Right? We're not dumb. So we've got the three phones, and as you can see, all right, those three phones together give me one possible location. They only intersect in one place. People who have done this sort of thing as you're talking about solving systems of equations actually look at that a little bit sideways because you think, ooh, I only just barely have enough data to pick that position. If I was to add another phone, what if that had potentially disagreeing information? In this case, hydrophone D, maybe it's got some bad data. Maybe it picked up a multipath, you know, instead of getting a straight line path to the bottom, maybe it picked up a ping that went up and then came down. Maybe it's just got garbage. For some reason there's a false detection or whatever. Now I've got more data. Maybe I need to bias my solution so it can potentially skew kind of up there to the upper right or maybe I can throw out that phone. I'm a little bit more error tolerant. And like I said, if I add more data, my tolerance for error only goes up in the two-dimensional case. In the three-dimensional case, now I can actually drop a hydrophone again. Right? All, imagine I did a whole bunch of intersection diagrams using hyperbolas. I can't do that in PowerPoint. It's awful. So this is the three hydrophone case. Essentially you need one more phone for hyperbolic tracking than you do in spherical tracking. All right. In the tracking scenarios, on the ranges that we deal with, we have standard conditions. The submarine is largely driving in straight lines for relatively long periods of time. We have targets that are more or less doing the same thing. Surface ships looking for all of these things, again, largely going in straight line paths. Life is pretty good in most scenarios. Now, the submarine starts launching weapons. It, the weapon has a pinger. The submarine has a pinger. Which one wins at the signal processor because they're in the same place? They're emitting, it's the same transit time, so the sounds are arriving at the phones at the same time. There's contention in the water now. So it's going to take some time before the weapon separates from the submarine and we can begin tracking each one of those. At what we call the end of run, by the way, these are exercise torpedoes. They're firing at each other, but they don't make holes in the other submarine. They turn away and then they come up and they have to be recovered. We put different heads, they're uh, weapon heads on the top. They aren't war shots generally, they're a different color and everything. At the end of run, so they're out of fuel, they need to be recovered, they go vertical, and if they're going from relatively deep water, it can take them quite a while to get back to the surface. Like I said, the pinger emits down, except down is now to the left. The hydrophones are down here, so all that energy is going that way. There's an excellent chance that I'm not tracking anymore. And that's all kinds of scary because now there's a weapon in the water doing something and then it shows up on the surface. And now it's rolling around in the waves because the waves in Hawaii are really quite large. And it gets hard to track again because the pinger is supposed to be pointing down, but it's rolling around back and forth. Sometimes it's pointing up. Doesn't go well through the air. All right. Now, all the way back out of the mathematics, now we're into the user interface requirements world, still in Java. What we're trying to do in this world is look at this big fire hose of data. It's really multiple simultaneous fire hoses of data. And we're trying to provide to the expert operator, of which I am one, which is sometimes to my own uh, consternation as they send me out to the water to do stuff. Uh, we try to give the operator many slices of and views on the same data. So we want to say, all right, operator, you need to be able to look at this data stream. So we have that time series graph, 
Maybe I need to look at the numbers. Maybe I need to look at the bars. Maybe I need to turn that whole graph on its side. Maybe I need to look at the posi positional data and all the time series, the core speed and depth. Don't try to read this. This is the numeric chart that an operator would normally deal with. The numbers are too small, but essentially we're looking at a standard table view where we've got course speed and depth and all of the other tracking mathematical uh, parameters that I care about. But we also have the emission time. That would be uh, this column right over here. This emission time, this is the last time that I had a good track on this target. That is a, p a very interesting number because I want that number there to be very close to that number there. Because if there's a large delta between those two times, I haven't had track on, say, this weapon for seconds and or minutes, and this becomes a range safety problem rather rapidly. Say again? This is emission time here. I'm talking about this MT number down here. Yes, that's what, that's what I call my master time number. Okay, so that's master time for the whole system. These numbers over here, these are calculated in terms of master time. They're track delayed and they're, the track delay column has gone off to the right there. Contact time is when I first detected this thing. This is data that the range cares about a lot. When did this submarine get detected and tracked? And when was this uh, weapon actually launched? Was it launched on schedule? People get scored on this sort of thing. And track acquisition time. Quite often, track acquisition time precedes contact time because the contact time is when validation kicked in and said, yep, I've got validated on this thing. It turns out that validation can then backtrack and say, well, perhaps I had validata all this time but I had to buffer up enough to say, yeah, I, I think I've got this guy. And then it can say, back up, say, about four seconds. And so that sometimes confuses people. And we're looking at seven phones in uh, solution. This is hyperbolic track. And you can see we've got quite a lot of hydrophones validating. Right. This is another way of looking at the data that's coming in. Again, don't try to read. What I'm looking at here is the Autech hydrophones. This is the sample data that I ginned up in my basement uh, last weekend. We're looking at the Autech hydrophones. We've got multiple targets in the water. This bottom here is all the raw data. The green is showing me validated data. So we've got a whole bunch of phones that are validating data coming in on these tracks. If you're an expert operator, again, you're counting up the data per second that's arriving. You expect to see about one ping per second. If you see multiple per second arriving, then you've potentially got bounce paths going on or some kind of reverberation. This is all that data, but now I'm looking at it in terms of numbers. Again, no reading. The numbers are too small. Anybody who's super curious, I can play it up here after the show, and we can look at the real numbers that are arriving. Green is good, yellow is good, white and blue are bad. What this is showing me is that I've not only got more data than I expect, I probably am listening to multiple targets on these phones I may have uh, ID contention, and I know I do because I made the data stream. That's what it looks like if you don't use the numbers. Okay, this is that time series data that I was talking about before. New data on the right, you know, cascading over towards the left. Uh, these are the hydrophones I'm listening in. And you look at that, it looks kind of like a fire hose. And this is definite ID contention. Tracking is doing fine with this scenario. I have greens and yellows carrying on just fine, but the operator is looking at this and saying, I don't understand this at all. So if I turn the data sideways yet again, I'm listening to Hydrophone 45 on target 1-2. So I have these two IDs that in a frame pinger that I was talking about before. 1-1-1-1, one, 2-2, one, 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 two, two, et cetera. This is the actual submarine that I care about. Over here is something else. And there's something else yet again. This is some other target that's using a 1, for instance. Maybe it's a 1-3, maybe it's a 1-4. This scenario happens all the time. It's actually very convenient when you're watching a weapon behave close to another target because you start getting uh, Hunt for Red October scenarios. And you can watch the behavior, for instance, if you have a sudden change. If you add, for instance, a slope upwards and then downwards, that's potentially a target or a uh, weapon locking on, change of speed. Uh, and I've done that during some of the exercises. And it's actually quite fun. You really can be 
you know, Dimitri, the sonar operator. All right. A little bit of history. I promised in the, the talk summary that I would talk about sort of the history of concurrency on this problem that we're trying to solve here. And that's that this system began before Java really was an operational language and or platform. It was towards the days when C++ was really becoming viable-ish. I was in graduate school back then and I was using C++ but I wouldn't recommend it to other people back then. So some of the code that is in the platform right now dates back to those days. This is something that I've heard in multiple talks while I've been here this week is that the burden that you put in the code right now, the framework or the implementation or anything like that, the lifespan is long, some number. There can be some average number. I don't know what that number is because it seems to be getting bigger as time goes on. I would like to say that we've dealt with most of our horrible threading problems. I cannot say that we've dealt with 100% of all of them. Horrible, yes. All of them, no. Uh, our requirements haven't changed during that time. We must not have data loss. Concurrency back in the day, poor implementations of concurrency lead to deadlock and data loss. So that was the motivation for solving some of these things. So our goal is no data loss, no interference between interface and the actual processing. This is an example of one of the problems that some of the early implementation code sort of inflicted on ourselves. This is very pseudocodeized to uh, try to illustrate what the problem was. Back in the day, someone decided that we needed to have a client server implementation rather than a single process. And so this was, you know, RMI looked like a really good idea. RMI, potentially a good idea, you know, to say, all right, here's my user interface event. I want the system to do something. Unfortunately, the implementation that the person chose, who's no longer with the government, uh, was to then make another RMI call from the server back to the user interface, which is an immediate implementation of deadlock. It's just deadlock that you haven't detected yet. Because who knows what's going to happen? You click the button too fast, and now the entire system is locked up because it's trying to process one blocking call while the other blocking call is reaching back. And so that was when I arrived at the government, that's a, one of the things that I started doing first, was just clicking the button a whole bunch of times. It's like, yep, I locked the system again. Like, no, 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 we can't have this. So in later days, what we said was, hey, you know, event bus, it's not bad. It's not the perfect message passing architecture, but it isn't bad and it wasn't hard to put in place because you could see a lot of the parallels. Most of what we're trying to do in the user interface world is not time critical. The submarine is six to eight seconds behind where we think it is. We're already late. So there's no reason for us to sit there and say, it is super critical for me to click this button and see an immediate change on the server side. I would like it to proceed a pace, but more importantly, I don't want to lock my user inter interface or my processing. I don't want to inflict any damage on either side. And so what we'd do is we'd say, all right, my detection reports are coming in. I'll pop them in a list. You know, I'll make that a, a synchronized list so that I'm not going to have contention, well, I'm not going to have uh, an actual data loss problem. But now I've potentially got blocking between these two processes, but it's better than it was before. I can pour that data through my event bus and at least allow my data acquisition to proceed apace. Maybe my user interface may have a deadlock, but I would rather kill the client side and let the server side keep going. Compromise at the time. Well, I, I wasn't happy with that compromise for very long, and so we very quickly started moving into the, the uh, concurrency uh, from Java 6 and Java 7, not talking about really sophisticated implementations. It's more or less like the copy on write array lock, or the array list that we're dealing with, where we're taking these detection reports and just pushing them into a data structure that later on we can send off to JFreeChart without having the locking in between. We want our data collection to proceed apace. We want our displays to show all the data that's coming in. Frankly, if I'm running it 100 times real time, all of that data is going to be cascading off the screen so fast, I'm really just going to be doing qualitative analysis rather than quantitative. I don't have a real requirement for real time speed at that point or super high accuracy. I just want it to go. And this allowed us to essentially then go to 
push it into swing invoke later, and you know, all right, user interface, do your thing. Do it as best you can. And my favorite implementation of user interface speed up is last one wins. The last data to come in, put that on the screen, carry on. No locking, just go, go, go. All right. So why am I talking about basics? Right? What we've established, sort of proof by existence, is that old systems get more and more thread unsafe as the time goes past. I don't know that I could produce enough data to prove that conclusively, but I'd say certainly emotionally, the older it is, the less thread safe it is. And what I'm looking for as the team leader is ways for me to minimize that problem. Again, I'm not trying for 100% correctness all the time. I'm trying for most correctness most of the time, as long as I don't lose my data. And essentially I'm looking for easy-ish solutions, best value. In Java 7, most of the basic data structures and the, the components that I'm dealing with there, no complex frameworks. Just pour it into copy on write and, you know, let the display put it up on the screen as fast as it can. Ooh, good. I'm on schedule. All right. I'm going to show you some data. You're going to drink a water. It is super important that we all recognize that what I'm about to show you is unclassified. I need to see nods. Okay, thank you. You laugh. All right. I have made up all this data. Nothing that I am going to put on the screen is derived from any Navy system, you know, allied or enemy, no, enemy or um, other. All right. I have put together what looks like a surface versus sub exercise, multiple weapon shots. The weapons, after they reach the target or miss, will rise to the surface and then will sit in a two knot surface current, which is going north south, and they'll drift waiting for recovery. I'm not going to show you the recovery process. I'm not going to show you the whole thing at one time speed because, frankly, uh, anti submarine warfare, the abbreviation ASW, also stands for awfully slow warfare. All right. I work for the Naval Undersea Warfare Center. We're rooting for the submarine in this exercise. <laughs> so, all right. This is, these are the Bahamas. Where's my pointer? All right. This is the island of Nassau. This is Andros Island. If you go to Google Earth, actually, the NASA Worldwind system that we're working on right now, if anybody works in a continuous deployment environment, you know that you get those good uh, releases going out on a regular basis. Our quarterly release was a few days ago, and I, as the team leader, said, no, I'm not bringing this to San Francisco. It's a little bit too fragile to demo right now. So sadly, I'm going to show you something that isn't quite as pretty as Google Earth. Maybe I'll get another chance another time. If you Google for Autech, you'll see right about there is Site 1. And I don't know if anybody saw the show on the History Channel about Autech, where they called it Area 52. Google that. That is a super funny show. Oh, my goodness. We have hydrophone cables that are running out here into the water, and they're covering sort of this area in here. I'm going to put on the screen in a minute the hydrophone locations out of context for the picture. The locations are actually potentially a little bit sensitive or for official use only. So I can't show you both things at the same time, but I will show you the grid of hydrophones that we're dealing with just out of the context of the shoreline here. So let me switch out of that. By the way, those are my kids. They think my job is awesome. They're a little bit bigger than that now. All right. So. As we can see, things are moving very slowly. Our friend the submarine is down here. Our friend the surface ship is coming down to the south. And we've got near perfect data coming in. I'll increase speed in a, in a moment. But I just wanted to show some of the uh, major user interface components. Let's bring up a speed chart. I would like to do a strip chart of speed. Let's do an auto scale. I'm using JFreeChart here because I work for the government and the key word there is free. <laughs> also, JFreeChart, I really, really like it. Very powerful, very low 
sort of maintenance and development cost. Uh, so nothing in particular is happening. Actually, my colors have switched here. So pretend the red is blue because my red is that guy. Oh no, I've got it right. As you can see, our submarine friend here was cruising along very fast and has done some sort of a speed change. He was coming on range and has acquired the target. Not really. I'm not modeling any of that stuff, but it's something like that. And has decided, okay, I need to slow way down because speed is noise and he's turning. That turn is something that they don't talk about in Hound for Red October is the submarine has what's called a toad sonar array. Has anybody heard about this sort of thing before? All right. He's towing that out and not really and is waiting for it to straighten out. Came this direction and is going that way to resolve that ambiguity. The toad sonar array provides a line of hydrophones which gives you in the spherical tracking case that, you know, uh, left right ambiguity problem. He's trying to resolve that because as he came in, couldn't really tell is my target on the right, is my target on the left. Okay, so again, let's just look at what this data looks like. I can see here, these are times of arrival and you might almost be able to read those back there. You can see that none of these times are quite the same and there's potentially a fairly large disconnect between them. But if you look for ping F here, ping F, ping F, ping F, those are arriving at different times at the various hydrophones because of the separation. And I promised I'd show you what the hydrophones look like. We've got quite a few hydrophones. Site 1 is right about there. Ish. Roughly. Our scale here is yards because people like making my life difficult. They like yards. You can set yards in the uh, in startup. But you can see as we're talking about the square footage of the range, we're talking about zero to over 30,000. So yards are meters if you're a reader of XKCD. And we're talking about a good sort of 40 by 40 kilometers. You know, rough order of magnitude. It's a very large area. And in the model that I'm using here, you can see that the whole range is lighting up. You know, I'm receiving these pings on a whole bunch of hydrophones. And I'm doing a very straightforward acoustic model here. So the real data would look slightly different, but it's representative. So let's zoom back in a little bit. And I'm going to speed up just so that we can have a little bit more excitement. We're still going slow. Tough. Okay. Slow warfare. We're not kidding. All right. So right about here, I'm expecting a weapon launch, not a real weapon. And I'll see a new stream of data. I will see a new tracker appear up here. And if I look at my, what I call my hide strip view, yep, there's a weapon launch. Let's look at this guy right here. Like I said, this is the data, sort of that, that hide strip view here in the background. That time series view, tall bars are, big, are better, that's good. This is that same data. It's only looking at hydrophone 46, which is this one right here. And it's looking at time versus fractional time. So if you imagine going left from right here on the bottom, these are integer seconds. That vertical part is the point whatever remainder. So our weapon here had a run out, had a course change directed, and the weapon's acquired. Now our surface ship did a counterfire down the same bearing, thinking, aha, I have detected the submarine. You looked in exactly the wrong place. To make matters worse, our friend the submarine fired three more weapons. Because why not? You know, this is Hunt for Red October World, you might as well. <laughs> All right. So we've got a swing and a miss here. That's going to be scored as a hit. These are two misses. And that's a probable hit as well. Look at all this data. Okay, you can see this is very high slope. That's probably a high velocity target in this case. And then an inflection point, probable change in speed. All right, now we've got yet another shot coming from the surface ship down to the submarine. It's using a different ID, also shared here, because I made this data for specifically this chart here. And it looks like it's closing at relatively high speed 
but it looks like it's going to miss. Unfortunately for the submarine, I made this data set. And so it's got a course change and a speed change. That's that inflection point right there. And it's coming right up the back. And there's not very much that it can do. That little picture right there is very interesting. You see how there's sort of double green coming in here? That's where the data is so close together that validation is having trouble telling these targets apart. And that's the end of run. So what we saw there was surface data, it's fine, submarine data, we're looking at multiple weapons and we saw the scenarios that we have to deal with in terms of, all right, we've got things that are moving very fast. For instance, one of the validation parameters that we have to keep track of is maximum speed. I'm not going to put that number on the screen because it's unclassified, but uh, let's just not. Um, that's settable in runtime where you say, all right, one of my validation parameters is this is the fastest I expect something to go. In this particular case, I was using multiples of 10 meters per second for everything on the screen because it was easier for me to do the math that way. And if you look in my notebook, there's all sorts of charts as I was trying to figure out which way I wanted things to go. But you can see we get a lot of data pollution very fast. You see that chart in the back. You know, there's a lot of information pouring through the system. And I'm not zoomed in very far, but in, for instance, when I was right in here, where these two guys were very close, you would have seen a little bit of jitter. This is considered acceptable because I don't have data loss. When these two targets are very close together, the tracks are going to be affecting each other a little bit. That is considered acceptable, partly because they rarely get as close as I made them get because the weapon will turn away. I can't model that because I didn't want to sit there and do the geometry. It took me all day to do the data set as is. All right, so let's see. Back to the slideshow. That's the end of the demo and that's the end of the talk. The contact information here, if you have critical feedback, please feel free to contact me here. If you would like to say something nice, this is the mailing address for the public affairs office. <laughs> feel free to say, attention Captain Kramer, you know, Dr. Cross is a really nice guy. And that's all for today. If there are any questions, I have a few minutes. Thanks very much, by the way. Yes, sir. You're talking about mammal impact? Yeah. The mammal impact group, there are two groups that operate our office. If, by the way, if that's not my group, if you'd like detailed information, contact the public affairs office and they'll give you far more information. They publish quite a lot of information. It turns out, well, we have two groups. One of them is specifically uh, mammal impact. And mammal impact could apply to any sort of operation, industrial or, or anything like that. If you talk about, for instance, the uh, uh, China Lake out there where they do actual missile impacts on dirt, there are plenty of mammals out there as well. But w when we're talking about sea life, uh, the, there's the mammal impact modeling team. There's also the people who listen to the hydrophone data and track individual whales and their behavior. These installations, for particularly the ones at Autech and in San Diego and out in, off of Kauai and Hawaii, have gathered enormous amounts of mammal information data. Species we thought were almost extinct turned out to be like rats. <laughs> you know, it, and the behavior of modeling that we get out of that is fascinating, but it's not my area, so I can't really speak to it. So yes, contact the Public Affairs Office or Google it. I'm sorry, you're hand over here first, sir. Oh, yes. Uh, the, everything here yep. had distribution statement A on it. Yep. So this is for all use. Every algorithm that I used and just talked about today has been published and has been out there for quite a long time. Uh, we have civilian systems yep. that want to do some sort of track accuracy. And you can do that in Narragansett Bay, which is where I live. Uh, you can do that at one of the other installations. You have to contact the range, and there will be a public affairs office there as well. So, yes? So, I would, is there a link to that? I mean, how would I start uh, finding that? Okay. I, I don't have that information in my head. That will, they're no joke. Those, if you, uh, newick.navy.mil, yep. 
Uh, you, there's phone numbers and there's contact information. Yeah. Yes, sir. Say again. We have a, we have a variety of te test methods. It's sort of a cascading scale. You have your basic unit tests. We have a bunch of test procedures where we're using archive data or simulated data, like something like this. Usually, it, those data sets were driven by scenarios that we saw on site. We have unclassified and classified labs in my building that are no, classified no higher than the secret level, which is my personal clearance, um, where we know what we expected to see, and this is what we saw instead. So there's multiple levels. We like to have all the, the tests pass before they would get out to the fleet. Sometimes that works great. Usually what they do is they find a new scenario. It's like, guess what? When you have three weapons that come directly at each other, the track looks poor. Like, well, of course. It's like, how often? Uh, the time between, uh, say, for instance, me writing new code to actually being on range is no more than 90 days. So we're writing code all the time. Uh, it's driven by customer requirements. Uh, right now, we're primarily focused on the display side. You saw that XY plot. That's a JFree chart plot. I really like JFree chart. Nothing about that is sexy. When you're doing demos to the Admiral, it doesn't really look pretty. Google Earth and such things, they look pretty, and they also give you a better geodetic display of what you're trying to show. So, awful all the time. But you, sir. On this particular team, my, my team is pretty large. And they, they keep putting more people on my team. Some of them are testers, which I think are great. I love testers. Uh, the core developers of the people who are still with the government, six to seven. Six. So if you have like a continuous integration, what is your, yes. what is your philosophy? What's your philosophy? So okay, the, the actual, okay, I can tell you the components. I work for the government, so nothing I say in the next few minutes condones uh, recommendation of any particular vendor or supplier, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> you know, everything that I, well, no. Uh, not everything that we use is open source. We do use open source partly because the price is right. Um, we do contribute to open source projects on the softwareforge.mil side. If you have a, a, a CAT card, which is a military ID card, you can access that, the forward side. Um, the development process is a modified feature-driven development where essentially we have a pool of cases that are prioritized. They happen to be in fog bugs because that plugs into a very low ceremony development process. We have a small number of people. So there are two different uh, repositories that go on the back end. Subversion is the older side. The new systems are going into Kiln, which is a flavor of Mercurial which comes with our Fogbug site license, which we paid money for. There was a competitive bid process, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there's uh, Eclipse and uh, NetBeans, depending on which one you like the best in between. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay, good. It's Jenkins now. We were using uh, Cruise Control for a long time. Yes, sir. The actual incoming data? The, okay, the transmitted data is ordered. So it's, you know, as first ping is ping one, then there's ping two, and then it rolls over to ping one again after it goes 16 of those. So that's one of the things that allows me to correlate between two different hydrophones. This ping one and that ping one must be the same. If, for instance, I had a very rapid ping rate in very short what's called baselines, different uh, distances between the hydrophones, I can get what's called a, a frame ambiguity where it's rolled over too fast, and now I don't know which ping one I'm talking about, but yes, there's a distinct order, and if you think about it, most of the time, you know, going from ping one to 16, it's 1,500 meters per second, uh, we're talking upwards of 10 kilometers at that point. So I can cover a pretty large footprint. As I up the ping rate, that area begins to neck down. So, is it good? Okay. Yes, sir. On the airborne side, I'm not talking, I didn't show any of the airborne data. We're also responsible for taking in the radar data at AUTEC. Um, the systems at the other ranges also provide radar data. It's an older display system. 
that doesn't pass through this code base, this particular code base, and those generally produce for me a, a TISP, a time space position information packet directly. And they, they produce it however fast they want to. A lot of those, if they were old missile control radars, are upwards of 20 times a second, which is relatively low bandwidth, you know, compared to everything else that we have to deal with. Yes, sir. The, the question is on, would we use machine learning? I would say machine learning in an unsophisticated sense is very much on our R&D plan because what we would li really like to do, and we've talked about this a lot, and it's not even a funding question, it's literally we don't have enough minutes in the day to start pulling into this, is to say we have years and years of archived data to say this particular target was at this point, which phones can hear it? because I'd like to be able to produce per phone a hearing volume because there are, I said, the bottom doesn't change very often. It does, over a period of 20 years, change some. We had one hydrophone down at Autech fall into a hole or something like that where literally the hearing volume changed. It, it fell into a ditch or something happened or it got caught on a trawl line or something like that where all of a sudden it wasn't hearing things that it should have been hearing before and it physically moved. So it had to be resurveyed and it turned out that that was an issue. We would like to be able to detect that. I would also like to be able to say, all right, I have a GPS source for this particular surface target. I know it's pinging. These phones can't hear it. Something's wrong. Or there's a, an occlusion. You know, I have, a, I have what's say, uh, called a pinger pole where I can temporarily mount a pinger in the water and put an acoustic tracking source on something for a little while. It might be on one side of the boat, so I can't hear over there. Is that good? So, Can I ask one more question? Sure. Do you use any common filtering? Yes, sir. We do mostly on the positions. Uh, I would really like to look into common filtering on the input, but we haven't done that yet. It's 2 o'clock, so you guys could go if you wanted to. Thanks very much for coming. <laughs>